put in then. Steve, I wonder if we'll have any any snap. I wonder if we'll do no, I've gone, well, we'll both hold up the same one. Uh, no, I'm, I've gone very boring and uh, I've got very boring. We're recording. Welcome to Wrong Speed number 19. Wrong Speed record chat number 19. It's 1 9. We have Mr. Steve and Mr. Carvis. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Yourself? Yep, that's yeah, I'm good as well. So thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> <laughs> so where are you? Tell me where you are. Carvis, tell you tell me where you are right now. I'm in my shed, oblique studio in uh in a flat in Clapton, basement flat Clapton Hackney. Beautiful. Uh, two or three roads from where Adrian Smith and Dave Murray grew up. And, I, and so um, I want and I, I went past Dave Murray's house the other day and took a photograph. Uh, well, he doesn't live there now, of course, but uh, took a photo of it. <laughs> and I'm, Steve, I'm, uh, where are you? I'm in my front room uh, slash studio and um, in Romford in Essex. Uh, coincidentally, not five miles from where Doris from Five Star originated. <laughs> Marvellous. <laughs> This is the band. That, this is the band that two thirds of you here do. The third person is. Tell me who the third person in the band the third is. Third person is Mike York. Sorry, Mike York. And um, where's um, he? If I'm not glitching out, the third person is Michael J York. <laughs> he's in uh, he's in Glastonbury or just outside. Yeah. But he's very near you. He's less than five miles from you, I think. Yeah. He is. He lives just down the road. I totally do not know him, though. So, but it's good to know that he's nearby for future future chats or something or other. Um, we're well, here. You, oh, he's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> so, if you need if you need a if you need a set of bagpipes making, he's your man, because not only does he play them, he makes them in Glastonbury, and um, not only that, he's also played them in in bands like Coil. I, I, I'm not sure, absolutely sure he's played bagpipes in Coil. My Carvis might know more, but he's been in Coil. He's uh, currently in current 93, although nobody's touring at all, obviously. And he's in an electronic band with Mark Pilkinson called Teleplasmist. And um, the three of us now have joined forces to, if that's the right term, to become Utopia Strong. We, we've had four albums out in the last 18 months, which is astonishing, really. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's brilliant. And are you planning on doing any more with Rocket? Yeah, yeah, we're just um, we're just um, working on the second Rocket record at the moment. Um, so we're getting together when when allowed and when able to, and working on that. I'd say we're probably well, about two thirds of the way through. I think so. It's it's very it's very exciting. And um, how are you finding working with Chris and Johnny? So I know them well from doing music stuff with them as well, and in my experience, they're very civilized human beings. Oh, yes, we're label mates, aren't we? Of course. Of yeah, I think they're wonderful. Of sorts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, of sorts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Steve, yeah. how are you finding dealing with the rocket people? I, I, I think I don't know. I think it was fated that yeah, because they're they're just absolutely wonderful people, and they just they, they they're you know apart from the fact that obviously you know, the, the the label's really cool. Um, when we first met them, I just think we felt that they were kindred spirits and. We were so pleased when they decided that they actually quite liked our album. Um, and of course, because of the fact that maybe there was a novelty aspect to it, I think they must have liked it a little bit more than just quite liked it because it was a leap of faith for them to, to put out an album that was unt untried, the band were brand new, and one of the members was was not exactly the type of body you'd expect. So. I, I, I still to this day sort of think that uh, it was great that they went with it because um, they could have easily have said, no, we don't want to get involved in any type of novelty. But of course, it's not a novelty. No, it's, it's genuinely, genuinely excellent. And it looks brilliant as well. They like, said uh, Johnny O did the art, that's, right? That's down to John O'Carroll. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, 
Yeah, I think they made on the strength of on the strength of that cover. I think they made oh uh, on selling the album. I think they made at least twenty five pence profit per album. <laughs> and um, so while I'm holding this up on the back, it says this. Medical, Medical grade, grade music, and um, Steve, hold up that book again. So now's the time to hold up the book. <laughs> Medical grade music. Yeah. So tell me about the book then. Someone tell me about the book. Cavus, tell me about the book. Oh right. Well, it was. It's a funny book, really. Um, it was going to be Steve and I recommending. 52 albums as a sort of way in to various different artists from everyone from sort of like like Art Zoid, Voivod, Shudder to Think, Melvin's, um, Magma, Koinji Hayaki, you know, j just a whole bunch of stuff that we felt really should have been written about. Um, Albert Mark. But we started writing, we started writing about these various albums. It was going to be us just kind of like, you know, evangelizing about them. I think I got about two or three albums in. I wrote about Voivod's Nothing Face. I wrote about Shudder to Think Pony Express record. I wrote about XDC's Black Sea. And I just keep repeating myself. And anyway, to cut a long story short, there the book sort of remained for a while. And we were hoping that they would have forgotten about it. And then Lee Braxton, who had who'd moved from Faber and Faber, who originally took on the contract, had started up his own uh, uh, sort of imprint called White Rabbit. And he still wanted the book. We had a big Zoom at the beginning of last year, and we and we and me and Steve just kind of came clean with him. Just said, "Look, we just we're not, we're not really music journalists. We can't really write this stuff." And over the course of the conversation, it kind of turned out that he really liked the sort of stories that went with us getting these albums, rather than the albums themselves so much. And from there on, it sort of turned into a memoir. But from my perspective, it's like a memoir of growing up, getting into music. Moving from you know my first band, my, being at school, my first gig, all that kind of thing, and moving up to London in the early '90s. And from Steve's perspective, it sort of picks up when he and I get together and we start DJing, and then we form the band, um, and then touring. And so, it, and it kind of cuts in between the two chapters. And the guy that put it together, Ben Thompson, because we just dumped a load of like, data on him. I'd, I'd written so much stuff, a lot of which didn't get used, but he sort of hacked it all. He hacked it all out, and then gave us the first draft and then i saw that it kind of really worked it's like oh this 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 is really nice and our two voices are very different i think but the stories keep coinciding and sort of meeting each other and then there's some sort of conversational bits as well so it, it's not really like any music biography i've read before and as to whether or not it's any good you know we'll let the we'll let the critics decide <laughs> yeah well um from from my perspective uh you know, echoing Carver's sentiments about how the book was originally going to be, it, it started to become a bit of a, a sort of albatross around the neck in as much as we were just going to rave about these artists we knew and all like, you know, and I just love the music. I don't really want to be knowing too much. Yeah, you know, I don't, it's not necessarily for me to know too much about the artist. I've always been that way. Mm. But then I started to think, oh, I've got to, I've got to dig into these artists so I can write a chapter on Albert Marcou, whoever it might be. And I was thinking, well, anybody can look this up on Wikipedia. This book's going to be crap. So the, we were really struggling to get, really struggling to get any enthusiasm going. But when it was the, when the idea was that it was about it was about our stories, one as Carbus as a musician and professional musician, and me as a fan who then ended up being in a band, that was a much more colourful story to me. And then we started enjoying ourselves writing it. And thinking of all the stories we had on the road, from my perspective anyway, the stories I have had since becoming a DJ and a, a musician, right? Which is still to me, I still can't quite, yeah, you know, I still have to laugh a bit. But it, then all of a sudden the book caught fire. And the whilst, I don't know, everybody believes that they've got a good product. I think this book quite quite fun to read. I think it's really, it's certainly not dry. Personally, I think Carlos is such a great writer that he is, a, he is actually music journalist potential should he want to be. It's honestly, seriously, it's like, okay, my bits are my bits. And I, you know, I, I've written them as best I can. 
but Carvis's take on, on music generally, it, honestly, it's brilliant. It's, it's absolutely worth reading it's if only for Carvis. I'm serious. Like, no, but anyway, my bits are sort of like, are quite fun in their own way, but a different style. But it's been a journey and, and hopefully people enjoy it. Anyway, that's the end of the sales talk. It wasn't really supposed to be that. <laughs> no, but it's, it's, it's interesting and it's out yeah, on Thursday. It's, like... it's, it's out on Thursday, but th this, this. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, but it, this um, this will probably come out in a couple of weeks' time. So, a couple of Thursdays ago, the book was out. <laughs> um, uh, but we're here to talk about records. <laughs> Let's talk about records. So it's always the best seller in America. <laughs> it's, sorry, there's three of us. It's absolute carnage with the talking. I need to. I need to. Uh, I need to uh, realign my Zen. I need to go back to Glastonbury for a few minutes just to sort of... <laughs> um, yeah. Let's talk about records. Carvus, hit me with a record from your favorite record shop, please. Well, as, as with everyone, it's very hard to have a favorite record shop. Um, for, for, there's been a few from various uh, points in my life, but here's one which I think was interesting for me. Um, I moved to London in 1993. I was 21 years old. Um, and there was a record shop down in Stockwell called These Records. It's not there anymore. Now, I think the word was, the word around the campfire was, I think it was started by Chris Cutler in the Henry Cow lot, perhaps. But And then I think it may have then gone on to have a connection with This Heat. But basically what it was, I was on the dole. I would, every, every, every time I cashed my gyro, I'd get a one-day travel card, go down to Stockwell, walk around to this record shop. It's about a 10-minute walk from the station called These Records. And, it, and sometimes you actually had to knock at the door to, to get let in. And it was uh, it's about the size of a front room. And in there, it really, really had this just kind of, it was like the mother load of the stuff I was into, particularly at the time, stuff relating to the kind of the whole Henry Cow lot, like sort of Fred Frith, and then by extension, sort of, I don't know, Skeleton Crew and Massacre and all the and kind of frithy stuff. But then also kind of things like the Plunderphonic stuff, like Bob Oster tag, and then stuff like Negative Land. And there was just shelves and shelves of this just fucking brilliant stuff, um, all pretty cheap, you know. So I got turned on to so much stuff, I could spend about seven or eight quid of my gyro and get about four records there. One of which was, and this ties in with both Steve and uh, the book and everything, one of which was, was about £4.50, I think, was Magma Live, which I got from there. Now, I'd already been turned on to Magma just before I left Plymouth. I'd, had a compilation tape done for me. This is, it's just a, it, I mean, it's a great way into Magma. It was for me anyway. And on the inside, we have one of my favorite quotes, which is, the music of Magma is like a mirror where everyone can see a reflection of who he is. And if you've got into Magma, it's absolutely true. So this this was a great way in for me. Um, and uh, and it's a it, it shame the record shop has gone, but if anyone remembers it, these records uh, in Stockwell was, was monumental really really brilliant place that i got turned on to so much good stuff there it sounds um sounds like the shop did you ever go to um second layer near um highgate tube do you know the one no. yeah no, it was it was there for a few no. years and it was come out of like highgate tube it's right on the main road there like the road out of archway whatever road that is the a1 whatever it's called up there yeah yeah yeah, yeah it was second layer and it was in a basement and it was very similar sort of um you had a feel of going into a betting shop in the 70s. You know, it was like you can't really see what's going right, on. Okay. And then you sort of creep in. And but then it's like a wealth of joy once you're in there. Um, I, that was a shop I discovered through the back of Wire magazine where they advertised regularly in the back of Wire magazine. And then I eventually went there. Yeah, yeah, I think. This may have this may have been in, the, in, in Wire as well. I mean, it was the guys were really nice. Everyone's disappeared. Everyone's frozen. There was nothing else to do. So you'd say, oh, is this any good? And they'd, they'd chat to you about them and what yeah. have you. And um, Steve, hit me with a shop. Hit me with a favourite record shop. Hit me with a record from it, please. Okay, uh, in that area, a couple uh, that I used to go to, but the first experience all of a sudden being blown away by a record shop was trips up to Virgin Records in its original state in Oxford Street. 
And um, that was you know, where I started to uh, explore music and get some of the, the more esoteric uh, records that weren't available anywhere else. <clears throat> Fast forward through the 70s to the 80s, and I'd sort of more or less dropped my original style of music and I'd become a bit of a soul boy. But I was in London and I thought I'd go, oh, pop into Virgin Records, which had then become a massive superstore by then. And um, I've always sort of, even, even what, during my soul music days in uh, years, I've always checked on Magma albums to see if they're in the shop because it's still a novelty. It was still a novelty that a French uh, you know, band were in. And um, in the Magma section, I found this, and this was 1988. So I found this album, uh, Offering by Christian Vander. Uh, it's the first Offering album. And um, sorry, it's not so art, it's not that arty, is it? But uh, see, yeah, there you go, look, that's it. Okay, so I bought, I bought this, took it home, and thought, wow, this is, even though it was a jazzier version of Magma and Christian Vanden's homage to John Coltrane, it, it was still Magma to me. And so it was that record that inspired me in 1988, uh, it's perhaps 1987 I found the record, it inspired me in 1988 to actually um, seek out Magma and hire them or book them to play in London after a 13 year hiatus. And so I became a music promoter for my sins, not a very good one. But if it wasn't for the fact of discovering that album, I probably wouldn't have got back into the style of music I'm now listening to again. I might have, I might have trundled on in the soul music world. So that's a very important album for me. And um, yeah, it, it is a fantastic album and includes a fan, a, an amazing track called Earth, which we DJed with and just causes people's jaws to drop. I'd, 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 I'd recommend investigating the track Earth by offering to have your head blown away. <laughs> Will do. <laughs> uh, and that, so that's just in Virgin on Oxford Street. Yeah, when, uh, but by that time, um, uh, it, it was a massive store by then. They'd taken over every other shop. It, when, when I went to Virgin back in the 70s, it was at the back of a, you had to go through a shoe shop and there was a spiral staircase to get upstairs. And that was, that's my memories of the place. But by the time I got there in, in the eighties, um, there was a cafe in there, massive floor space, and it was a much more modern affair. Mm. Um, yeah, and it was sad to see it go through sort of, you know, the changes over the years, but obviously vinyl was very, was still sort of big then in 87. Mm. That, Cause there was, there was the time when the, you had the Virgin, it was enormous, wasn't it? On, the corner of like Oxford Street and Tottenham Court Road, right down the bottom, is that right? And then HMV, the one, half, yeah. yeah, and then HMV was kind of just as big, like halfway mm. up Oxford Street on the right. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I was I was trying to be loyal to my to my original um, to my the original label that, that that hosted things like Henry Cow and and Robert Wyatt and uh, obviously the the original Tubular Bells was there as well, so. In their day, Virgin Records were heroes. Richard Branson was a hero. It's sort of weird how he's a pantomime villain now, but um, at the time, they were massive. You know, they were so important. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's meant to be a really it? good comic shop at the top of Virgin as well, actually. <laughs> uh, just to, to, for the geeks, I used to come and buy comics. From, I used to come up from Plymouth and do the tour of all the comic shops in London, sort of like Mega City, Gosh. What have you? And there was a there was a really good comic floor right at the top of the Virgin. You used to go up these stairs, and there was behind glass there was like a vinyl pressing, like a lathe, like just as a sort of display. And then right at the top was a little comic uh, floor. Cool, yeah. And and there and now guys are there now, right? Is that right? I haven't been there for a while, but am I right in thinking that Virgin H and V are both gone? Yeah, well, Virgin yeah. definitely has. I can't remember what it is now, but. I get it so long since I've been to Oxford Street, actually. Yeah, same. Same. I haven't either. Uh, what? Um, when Carbus is talking about his next record, I'm going to run away to the toilet. So really, don't 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 worry. <laughs> okay. Let's do that now, then. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> I'll make it a piss-length conversation. Hit me with memories. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, it's. I mean, it's funny with with records and memories because you know they've all they've all got memories, and if anything, that there's nothing like a record really to to trigger a memory. But um, what one that's like a particularly pivotal one for me was um, this record shop in Plymouth, Rival Records, which is like the independent record shop in Plymouth. It was amazing, and I knew all the staff there. They're really nice. <clears throat> and the previous year, 1988, I was 16. I'd, I'd been turned on to Cardiacs, which completely changed my life you know and uh, would continue to do so the two bands really at that point 1988 i got turned on to a little man in a house by cardiacs and which i bought from there and also i bought um dimension Hatros by voivod from there in 1988 and it, from that point onwards it was kind of like scorched earth on anything i'd listened to before for a long time really and so i was eagerly awaiting the follow-up in 1989 and i was at college down the road at like sixth form college kind of thing doing my GCSE retakes. And I'd heard that Cardiacs had a new album coming out. And each week I would go in, go in at my, at my first break, would go into Rival Records, it was a 20 minute walk. So he's on landing the sea in yet, and it wasn't. And then finally, after about what seemed like about a month and a half, the guy, Neil, sort of just went like this and, and up on the counter, not the counter, on this like sort of like um, display was what I have come to know is the greatest album ever recorded. Or, or at least in as much as, when I, whenever anyone says, what's the greatest album ever recorded? The first thing I think, On Lennon in the Sea. And I, I skipped the rest of the day at college, went back to, to my house, where I was leaving my parents, put it on and just, mwah, just absolutely love it. And this did really, I was already, they were already my favourite band, but this seemed to just go so much even deeper than the, the album before. So this really, really, and this still smells lovely. This is, this is every, this was everything to me, really. That record that record is a masterpiece like absolute masterpiece. yeah 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 absolutely and and um i yeah, uh yeah. I, it took me a while to get into it but then and i want to mention the fact that you played with them for a bit right so you're a guitar tech for a bit and then you yeah, played yeah. with them for a bit and for me um yeah, yeah. the thought of playing those songs just it blows my mind like they're so like intense <laughs> And there's so much going on that it, I'd feel like I need a, a degree of music to play it. It's insane, but it's it all it's so smooth. I, I can't even just, read music actually. No, nor, nor can I. Nor can I. But it just runs so beautifully. The whole <laughs> album. It is a masterpiece. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think it is a masterpiece. And for me, that was more more than anything. That album was the clarion call for me to move to London and to be part of whatever was going on with Tim. And just that, that you know, to, to be drawn into the kind of cardiac circle because there was sort of no going back after that. It was like, okay, this is. It, it was only a matter of time before I moved up. I think. Steve, a record with memories. Um, school, school memories, really. Um, going back, I think my first big group that I really fell in love with. I think prior to Magma, actually. I was a bit of an Argent fan back in the day. Maybe they were the first for me, but um, I quickly found and discovered via the different radio shows that are out there. Um, this. Gentle Giant, Power and the Glory. And um, arguably their best album. There's so many great albums by Gentle Giant, but it reminds me of my school days. That's not my original album. That's I had to buy it again after it was stolen from the school PE locker room. But um, <laughs> the, the album sort of like a little bit of a themed album, but it, it's not so much that it, it, it's of its time. There's no reason why anybody would like to would get into Jail Giant now in one respect. But if you're talking about the great prog artists who don't sound dated, if that's the correct way of describing it, I think Gentle Giant has stood the test of time brilliantly. They're so clever and um, so many great albums, certainly their early ones. And uh, it's, a, it's sort of like got its special place in my heart because it reminds me of when I was 14, 15, 16 years old. And this stuff, when it first came, when it came out, was, was a revelation to me. Uh, I, was, I wasn't like Carlos understanding the music as strongly, but it just appealed to me. And for me, whilst there were, great, there were a load of great prog bands, um, for me, I think Gentle Giant were my favourite. Uh, whether they were the best who knows how can you judge but for me i think you know 
if you called any band a prog band that I like listening to, because I don't think Henry Cow would have been a prog band. Not, I, I don't think a lot of, I don't view the Canterbury scene as prog, even though I suppose it's lumped in with that. But as prog bands go, I think Gentle Giant uh, are top of the tree. Was that from um, an era where you would just, this, it's a common theme that I keep bringing up maybe, but was that from an era where you would buy one album that would have to last you? for like a month or so and you just have to keep listening to it or? Yeah, I, I, and I still to this day can't work out where I got the money to actually buy some of these albums because it, it wasn't like anybody was minted in my family and I wasn't getting massive pocket money. But yeah, obviously, you know, but I wasn't buying a fantastic amount. You know, Gentle Giant was, you know, as soon as the Gentle Giant album came out, that was what I was getting. Nothing else was going to be uh, taking, uh, but there was a lot of tape swapping. So a mate of mine, we used to do a load of tape swapping. And that's one of the ways that people used to get around that. Yeah, yeah, well, same here, exactly the same. Yeah, and, and what we would do is we would have one of us, let's say there's a group of five or six of us that were buying records. We would all buy different ones and then we'd all tape them and then you'd have them like that. And then secretly you were thinking, I wish I'd bought that one rather than this one. And that's really, really that's annoying. Really um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's um, my favourite Gentle Giant album, that one as well. Ah. Power and the Glory. I think it's the I think it's like the most sort of well, I don't say it's the most out there, but it, it yeah. it's just it's like distilled gentle giant that one. Oh. Oh, I have a cap on. oh yes, you are gonna Oh look! Oh I heard what what make I've got what make is that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a toy poodle. <laughs> His name's Monty. Oh. After Monty from Withnail and I. Monty. I'd, <laughs> <in there. laughs> I'd bring I'd bring my dog in, but he's an asshole, so uh, <laughs> he's been robbing the house. Um uh Cavus, hit me with a bargain find, please. Delay. Oh, okay. Here's a funny one. Let me find it. A bargain find. Um, where is it? Well, I just I just started college, um, as I was saying, uh, in Plymouth, d retaking my GCSEs. And um, a guy that I was doing English with, you know, I was really in, into like, you know, metal. And he said, oh, I've got some, got some Iron Maiden singles. And it turned out he had um, uh, an Iron Maiden single I didn't have. Now, I'd and I'd been after Twilight Zone. For a while, I know I, I don't think I'd even heard it at this point. It's really hard to get hold of, and it turned out he had Twilight Zone. I think I only must have paid about a couple of quid because I had no money I, on clear vinyl. Now he also had Purgatory, which is a much better tune. I think it's one of Maiden's ten out of ten tunes. Purgatory. He had Purgatory on red vinyl, but I already had that on seven inch on normal black vinyl. I'm still kicking myself that I never bought the red vinyl of Purgatory because it's a much better cover and much better tune as well. But here it is, Twilight Zone. I think I must have paid a couple of quid for it. I don't know how much it was worth now, but I remember seeing it going for about a hundred and something. On you used to get that big book. A friend of mine, Laurie, from my band Monsoons, worked at the Record and Video Exchange in Notting Hill, and he had the book with pricings in it. I remember it was worth like maybe a hundred and something. Wow! In the nineties, so that, that that must have been a wow. bit of a bargain. <laughs> there we are, oh. Twilight Zone, clear vinyl. Not, not one of not one of their best at all, but you know, I don't know why they released it as a single, but there it is. <laughs> they, they released hundreds of singles. All these bands, <laughs> like <laughs> they released everything as singles in those days. <laughs> yeah, Steve, yeah. hit me with a bargain find. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. I, my my biggest bargain find was was in the soul music world, where I, I you know used to occasionally find records that were uh, cheaper than they should be in secondhand record shops. But eBay before Discogs came along was um, was a pretty good place to to occasionally get a bargain. And I've got this. Um, we're going over old ground here again. I've not you know, my my favourite band is Magma, but I just want to show this. I'm not too sure that Carvis has even seen it. So here is a. Uh, if I hold that up to the camera, uh, oh my God, look, I can't. Can you see that? What's it say? What's it say? New... Oh, hang on. Is that a white label of Udu Wudu? 
Yeah. Is that what it is? It's a, well, it's an acetate. Wow. It's an acetate. And it, it came up on eBay. I haven't got a clue whether it's whether whether it's worth a load of money, but it came up on eBay. I think I got it for like 20 or 30 quid. But it's an acetate of Udu Rudu, which is one of Magma's uh, mid-70s albums, which is just fantastic, obviously. They don't do bad records, but um, you know, as a sort of pride, proud sort of owner of that, I sort of felt like I'd rescued it from wherever it was being sold from. And uh, for, as a Magma collector, it's sort of a pretty prized collection. But they, the word Udu Rudu, uh, Udu Rudu is spelled U-D-U-W-U-D-U. But on the uh, acetate, it's spelled U D U V O U D U. So they've whoever wrote that uh, didn't really know what they were doing. So voodoo, 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 voodoo. Anyway, that's uh, I suppose a bargain. I uh, said I say to other people that it doesn't. It's not so much like what something's worth. It's like if you've paid, you know, if you've paid what you think is right. And then you've listened to it loads and loads and loads, then that's the bargain side of it. It's not so much that it's now worth a crap load and you only paid 2p. It's more that yeah. you've just had what you think is the best time from this record. I'm not like a yeah. for, for me, I, I'm I'm happy to buy reissues of everything. I don't really I'm not I'm not out hunting. Yeah, I'd rather have yeah. five new records than one, you, you know, I'm not too, I don't. I don't buy into yeah, all of that. Yeah, I agree. Stuff. I'm the same. I, no, no, I'm the same. I, I want that. I want what's on it. You know, I like. I like LPs because I. I like. They mean that I can only listen to LPs in my front room, which I like. It means I have to stay there and listen to them, and I just like them because they're a nice thing. But I don't think they sound better than CDs. I. I just like the the, the size and the smell of them, and I think they're nice things. But yeah, I'm the same. I'm. I'll very happily buy a, a reissue of something. I'm not bothered. You know, I'm not bothered about having something with pops and crack. Crackles, uh, you know, that's the original. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, just before we go on, I wanted to just talk about your um, your album again. I have the orange vinyl. Were there more than one pressings of it, or was it just orange? Ah. Three. Three. There's, uh, there's the orange vinyl that was uh, given uh, only exclusively to the record shops to sell. And then there were two other versions, uh, two other versions. There was um, a dark transparent blue and a pale blue with a, a black blob in the middle. And they were sold by rockets. And, um, and, and uh, the, the pale blue one with the, the black hold edition, as it's called, seems to be the most popular as far as rarity is concerned. Right, yeah. Um, they're, they're all equally as rare. It was like 500 of each. So. <laughs> no, that's, that's good though. Like, the classic, so, classic what rocket, I wanted they, to love their, they love their groovy... So sorry, what I wanted to talk about actually was sorry, that when when I when I listened to the album, I, I actually I, I actually put it on Twitter yesterday. So I'm repeating myself. If anyone pays any attention to that, but have either of you seen that um, John was searching for aliens documentary that was on Netflix? No, no, no. Any it's good? a 15 minute. It's a 15 minute film, and it's on Netflix. And it's about this fella who built a radio station in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 And he was, was he, it's not the guy that was sending uh, music out into outer space, was it? Yeah. Yeah, to try and, like, yeah, great. Yeah, you watched it. No, but I heard about it. I've heard about it. That's all yeah, right. but it's, it, anyhow, so give it a watch. But it's 15 minutes long. And um, what the, the records he's playing are things like, um, like harmonia albums, and he's blasting them out. He's blasting them out sort of a hundred thousand miles into space with this like high powered thing that he's built in his grandparents' living room. It's absolutely brilliantly insane. So, but one of the records he plays, do you know this guy? Kay Lima. No. K, it's K L E I M E R. But for me, when I listen to these two things, it's what uh, it's what makes this. So, wow! It's especially like like dig this fella up because it's insane. But there's he plays a few of these songs and he's blasting them into space, and it's absolutely marvelous. 
anyhow, I was just getting excited there, but definitely. Yeah, these two. When when the album when yeah, when our album first came out, I think that the the the, the hook that people did hang it on more than anything else was Cosmish yeah. music. So yeah, that was and yeah, and the people saying, oh, it's really like cluster and that, which was really great. Yeah, you know, for us was a, an amazing compliment, you know, in as much as we weren't trying to do we, we never set out to do any any particular style, it just evolved. But you know, to have somebody then go, yeah, it stands up to cluster was like, wow, that we'll, we'll take that, we'll slap your hand for that. Uh, it really does. It, I, I think it's brilliant. But just out of interest, is there real bass guitar on there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the yeah, I played that, yeah. Yeah, that's actual bass. Yeah, that's kind of one of the things that hooks me in actually is hearing a bass guitar just because that's my thing. So when I hear that in amongst it and it's all mixed in really nicely. Yeah. This actual <laughs> it's one of the things that does it for me just to have real that's bass underneath. One, yeah. yeah, underneath the sort of the synthiness is what gets me. In yeah, I the cannot. Whole, I, the I, whole record. Go on, Steve, sorry. No, go, go, go. On. No, you say Steve. You know you got. I was going to say that the, the whole thing we record, apart from the fact that it was recorded onto um, a laptop, the whole thing was done like we were making a record in the old days, not necessarily deliberately. We weren't trying to be sort of retro-ish, but because of the the nature of modular synth, we we couldn't we couldn't stick it to a grid anyway. So they were they were you know they, they were doing their own thing, and so everything was played live. So even like tambourines. There's lots of real tambourine percussion. It was all done live rather than taking one thing and looping it. So it, it, if anything, it gives it a much sort of friendlier, I hasten to use the word organic because it gets overused, but it, it, it has made it sound more like one of those 70s records just because the way we did it, there's, there's you know almost no looping on it at all. Yeah, that is what it makes it work. It makes it feel so sort of, it's kind of uplifting and natural, I would say. So there we are. Thanks. Man. Um, Okay, Steve, hit me with a record bought on tour. And I know that maybe you've not done loads of band tours, but I do not doubt that you've traveled around the world going to record shops, so. Yes, I have, yeah. Um, and I was fortunate enough to go to Brazil uh, to play snooker, um, a Brazilian version of snooker. Um, out of the blue, a television company phoned me up or phoned my management up and said, We've got this champion out there. He's unbeaten. He wears a cap. He's called Rui Chapeau. And we want, and he's unbeaten. He's been unbeaten for so long. And he's got to the stage where he said he'll only take the cap off um, when somebody beats him. And you're the world champion. So we need to hire you to come over to Brazil to beat him so that we get to see what's under his cap. <laughs> little did I know. So little did I know when we got there that the game wasn't snooker. It was a totally different type of game with different rules and different. So I had to try and learn this game very quickly. So it was, a, it was no, by no means a foregone conclusion. I did actually beat him, but honestly, I think it was more by stroke of luck because it was just all new to me. But on my days off from practicing this new game, I, I sought out different local record shops in Sao Paulo. And I found some brilliant jazz music and fusion music. And... Um, uh, along the way, one of the and I bought a load of these albums and I, I sort of brought them back. And the, one of the albums I bought was this um, by uh, a band called Gru Grupo Medusa, and the, the album's called Ferrovias. And there was one track on here, um, I'm trying to think what it's going, I think it may be the, the title track actually. Um, and I sent a copy to a person that was really entertaining me at the time, Robbie Vincent who did a, a really great soul show and jazz stuff as well. And he played the, he played the album, which I was really chuffed about. So, yeah, so it was a, a so, you know, I, I lugged back from Brazil about, I don't know, I, I bought them in units of 10. I lugged back about 150 albums and, uh, you know, got, got them all through part, you know, security and customs. God knows how I did it, but it, it was, it was exciting at the time, but uh, a visit to a record shop in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, back in the, uh, early 80s or the mid 80s wasn't as easy because nobody spoke English at all you know Portuguese was the language and you just get so used to going to countries where people do speak English but that was the first place I've ever been to really where yeah you know, so I went into a super, I went into the supermarket and nobody spoke it not one member of staff spoke English it was it was a, an eye-opener in a way so and, and good actually for the soul yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. You must have you must have travelled and gone to record shops all around the world, though. That that's I am um, I'm immensely jealous. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. uh, I've never been to one in China. I've been to loads in Hong Kong, but I never went to one in China. I should have tried to. I think I think by that time they'd moved on to CDs, so perhaps vinyl was not massive. But yeah, you know, a lot a lot of the Chinese they're, they're classic... pretty big on vinyl now. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're big on vinyl in China in China now because we played there with Gong a couple of years ago, and we just brought CDs, and they're all saying, "Oh, we want vinyl, we want vinyl." So um, and there's a really cool record shop in Shenzhen with mainly vinyl there. No, never, never been, never been. Yeah. Very jealous. Cavus, <laughs> uh, record bought on tour. Well, it has to be a CD if that's all right. Um, I, yeah. Yeah, um, I had just sort of, I'd say I just joined Cardiacs because um, once you're in the Cardiacs gang, it's like joining Cardiacs as, as guitar tech. And we were on tour with Chumbawamba um, in, well, I can't remember what year it was now. Um, was it 96, 95, something? I'd only just got into the gang and we got to Glasgow um, and this had just come out, and uh, it's Sonic Youth uh, washing machine. And because we were on a tour bus, my first time on a tour bus, there's a CD player on there, so I went straight. I bought it in Glasgow and went straight back to the the bus and listened to it. Now, for me, I got turned on to Sonic Youth with Sister, and I was so not blown away by it. At first, I was actually. I'll tell you what. If we've got a minute, I'd, I'd read a lot about Sonic Youth and the NME, and I'd sort of been put off them. And it wasn't until um, the NME put out this compilation tape called uh, for Childline called Sergeant Pepper Knew My Father. And it was all the tracks on Sergeant Pepper's being done by different bands. So, like, The Fall did uh, Day in the Life at the end. Frank Sidebottom did, like, um, Being for the Benefit of Mr. Kite. And Sonic Youth were doing the, the Indian one, Within You, Without You sort of thing. And I heard it and I was just completely blown away. It was like, I felt, I still think it's better than the Beatles one. And so I realized I got it all wrong about Sonic Youth. I heard Sister and I liked Sister so much. I was frightened to listen to any more of their music because I, I thought it wouldn't be as good. But I finally got into Daydream Nation and I kept up with them. But I must admit, I, I didn't really get into goo i mean there's a couple of songs i like on it but i wasn't mad on it didn't get into jet set trash and no star apart from the single bull in the heather so i kind of i liked sonic youth i wasn't against them but they really since daydream nation they didn't do anything that grabbed me this came out and absolutely knocked my head off and i saw them for the first time on this tour as well but it's two, two favorite sonic youth songs um skip tracer the lee ronaldo tune which is just got the most amazing lyrics brilliant tune and then the Diamond Sea. I don't know if you know this album at all, but yeah, yeah, yeah. twenty minute Diamond Sea. The whole C. side, isn't it? it for me, it, mm. oh, I love it. It's it's like their version of Pink Floyd's Echoes, but I, I think it's much better than Echoes. Actually, I'm, I really just, just really love it. And from that point onward, um, I, I, from that point onward, I just thought they had this incredible run, run of records. Um, I thought Thousand Leaves was great. Uh, New York City Ghosts and Flowers was brilliant. It wasn't so mad on Murray Street, but for me, they then did this one right at the end, Rather Ripped. It's my favourite guitar sound ever recorded. And I, I think Rather Ripped is as good as anything they've done. I think it's as good as Daydream Nation. It's as good as anything they did before. And I think there's a case to be made, and I'm going to make it, that I think as, as, as seminal as pre-washing machine Sonic Youth are, I think there's a case to be made that even if Sonic Youth had just started on this record, if this is their first album... The run that came afterwards, I still think there's a case for them being one of the greatest bands of, uh, of my lifetime anyway, even discounting the first stuff. That's how good I thought they were. They were I, like my, it was, for me, it was, I missed out on the Aussie era Sabbath, but I got, I got to have Sonic Youth. They, they, were, my, they were my Sabbath, really. I, I, um, I really like the uh, Jim O'Rourke era of Sonic Youth. He steps in and does, uh, yeah, the Jim O'Rourke era with... Um, like there's like a four album run with him. I think he yeah, added something yeah, yeah. to them. It, it was like a, a melody underneath it all that was really nice with him involved. Yeah, yeah. I saw him with him at Shepherd's Bush actually. It was really good as well. Mm. Yeah. But they played they played the forum doing washing machine and it was as if they had given me a blank piece of paper and said, write out the set list. Because every single song was like, oh, I can't believe they're fucking doing this. <laughs> 
I can't believe they're fucking doing it. It was really, really good. <laughs> because they're a good example but, of a band oh. that ran for, for what, how long did they go from? Like 19, early 80s, right? 1982 or something. Yeah, yeah. And that they had like a good 30 plus year run. And there aren't many bands that do that, you know, that, are, you know, you could, like, I think The Fall do it, Sonic Youth did it, and how many others, like, have that sort of... Yeah. The internet is crazy. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, there's loads that went on. I mean, you could say, like, yeah, that's, yeah I know, it's the same here, sorry. But, 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 but like I say, with Rather Rip, to, to do a record like that right at the end of their career, the second to last album, and for me, to be as good as anything they've done before, and like I say... Rather ripped and peace of mind by Iron Maiden. That that's how you record a guitar, I think. There's a there's a really left field. Can you hear me? I'm just making sure you can. Yeah. yeah. There's a there's a there's a left field album called Simon Werner from a film. I really enjoy that one. It's still like um, it's not trying to be anything too special, but it's a really good sort of soundtrack. I don't know it. Mm. Mm. It comes. I uh, just I just looked up where it is in the timeline. Um, it's after Rather Ripped. It's in from 2011. It may only be Thurston Moore do it. I don't know. Oh, right. Okay. Is it um, Thurston Moore's got a record shop in London now, right? Yeah, it's Stoke Newington, yeah. Uh, ecstatic Peace, yeah. Mm, mm, yeah. I bet have, you been, have, you, have you ever been there, either of you, to his shop? No, I haven't actually. It's just down the road. I used to live in Stoke Newington, but yeah, it's just down the road. But no, I haven't been yet. No, no, no. All right. I'm not brave. I'm not brave enough to get on the train yet. <laughs> I don't know how you'd get on to Stoke Newington a train. I guess. Uh, okay, hit me with a record that you wouldn't think that anyone would dig, Steve. Well, I'm not too sure it's anyone, anyone would dig or what anybody would think that I wouldn't like, or I don't yeah, know. Yeah, a record that people would be surprised that you liked, or... Oh, well, here we go. This is, the, this is the worry, isn't it? This is the one. Okay, so if I'm, a, if I'm at a party and it, it's not a party with friends who listen to music, obviously yeah, you're always disappointed with the music, but if ever... If ever this comes on, I'm, I'm happy because it makes me dance. It makes me want to dance. So here is a 12 inch record. <laughs> uh, it's Fat Man Scoop, uh, the Crooklyn Clan feature. Uh, it's called Be Faithful. And you, you probably know it, even if you don't know the name of it. I'm not going to sing it, but. Um, it makes me want to dance. So I, I bought it just in case I was ever DJing at a wedding. Not that we do weddings, but if I was ever DJing at a wedding, this is what I'd like to hear. Fat Man Scoop, be faithful. <laughs> There's nothing else to say about it. <laughs> I'm not sure there is. <laughs> but it's good that you own it. And you, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. like, a 12 inch, you know, it's the original one. You know, it's there. I mean, it's, not, it's not in my prize record racks it's sort of like laying there on the side sort of going what on earth am i doing here the record itself is scratching its head wondering <laughs> why it's next to every car album so, so i took it away and just put it on to, by the side <laughs> yourself there covers any uh well and anyone who knows me I, I don't think there would be anything that would surprise them because i kind of like i like most stuff really but uh, so I've, I was sort of thinking, well, what, what, what can I say? What can I say? But here's one because I can. There's, there's a few things I can say about it. I've got altered images, Pinky Blue there, and uh, the reason I picked this one, it's got my favourite altered images track, an album tune called "Think That It Might," and Claire Grogan was my first crush uh, when they came on um, Top of the Pops playing "Happy Birthday." As a boy, I had feelings for Claire Grogan that I had never <laughs> experienced before. <laughs> But what, what I really love about Altered Images, um, and uh, so I didn't buy their records at the time when I was a kid, but then once eBay came along and you realised you could buy records, I, I sort of got the, you know, caught up with them. And it struck me how gothy their, their album sound. It's like it was the first album was produced by Steve Severin from Susie and the Banshees. But the, the brilliant thing about Altered Images is that, how can I put this? I think there, there are bands 
that are very accomplished musicians, I suppose. And you think, well, you could probably be playing any one of 10 genres of music. You've, you've got it in you. You could have been a, a funk band or a metal band or whatever. But with with Alton Images, I, I suspect that th this was the only sound that those five guys could make. This was that, you know, they, they couldn't have done anything else but make this kind of music. And it's wonderful. And it's just the sound of those five people making this probably the only kind of music they could make. And I, yeah, I think they were a really, really fantastic band. And there was, there was so much of that. When I, when I came online in the early 80s, there was so much of that. Um, I think it was just post-punk post rather than post-punk. It was post the punk thing. So the, the punk thing had made everyone just pick up instruments and want to form a band. And then this was just like kind of the, 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 sort of the ethos was still carrying on. So people were doing that. So why, why you wouldn't call it punk exactly? It just, it is those, it sounds like five people just like, well, let's make music that sounds like this. And it's so lovely. It's got this lovely Scottish chimey kind of thing, which has probably got a lot in common with this kind of orange juice and the, the, the postcard label and all all that sort of thing. And then later on, I suppose, stuff like Mogwai and what have you. But for me, there's there's a real magic towards it images. And I still listen to this and the album before it all the time. I think it's wonderful. There you go. Did, um... Did you watch the, uh, there was a Scottish indie documentary on Sky Arts about two months ago. And it was, no, that, no, no, no. It was that era, it was them, but also like BMX Bandits and that sort of little period there before Teenage Fan Club and whatever else got big. Yeah, yeah. It was a really nice, it was a really nice look at especially Glasgow and, and that oh, world of music. Great, yeah, I'd love that. Yeah. It felt like a, if they felt like a youth club, it was quite it was kind of lovely in a way <laughs> you know yeah yeah was was yeah. altered images on it yeah she was on it she was she was she was a talking head at least oh, great. Okay. yeah yeah right then i'm in that's it that's, that's, you, you had me there <laughs> um okay uh i wanted to talk about guapo briefly Talk about Guapo, yeah. Let's do it. Let's yeah, because I, I feel like um, just quickly, only only quickly, because for one, I think that I think our band played with Guapo way back when we started, um, maybe a few times at like either festivals or whatever. But I wanted hey, to hey, know, Colossus. Yeah, yeah, it rings a bell to me, like uh, maybe a festival in Oxford specifically, but some others. Um, also, I wanted to know what you thought of this record and whether this record was an influence. Can't see what it is. What? Noxact. Oh, Noxact. No, yeah. I, I don't know it. So I know the cover, but no. I, I mean, I I joined Guapo in the. I joined it that me early. I think two thousand and four. I think so. They'd already had a, a a lot of stuff before I joined. Although they, they were friends of mine anyway. Yeah. So um, I didn't really start kind of writing for Guapo until about two or three years later. So it, it wasn't an influence on me, but it may well have been on them. Yeah, but this, they were like, a, they did like about th three albums, maybe Norwegian, kind of hefty, but pretty avant with it band. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I remember them being around and seeing their name on things and, and seeing this record, but never heard it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, okay. that was, I, I was just intrigued by whether there was any connections between the two bands, because it certainly felt like it when I listened to them both. Anyhow. Okay. Anyhow, <laughs> hit me with a favourite ten inch, Steve. Uh, okay. Well, I think I've, somewhere I've got a, an Alteca uh, box set of ten inches, which is, I suppose, quite nice to have. But looking through my ten inch records, there's nothing that's massively my favourite, other than maybe something that has some sort of memories of DJing, even though I didn't DJ with it. So, um, uh, Tony Holden, um, Holden. Um, Renata from the album Inheritors. So it's a 10 inch record of that. It's lovely, very nicely made. And the, the track Renata, we've DJed with on occasions. And uh, there, are, there are a number of electronic artists that I've stumbled upon and discovered. And I think uh, Holden is kind of a, he's a top notch uh, guy. And he's really, um, he, he, he makes. He makes music. He started off, I suppose, in the techno world, as a lot of them did, but he's moved into other territory now. And he, he's done some great albums now with bands as well. So uh, he, generally, he's moved more psychedelic as he's got older. But this was like a transitional album called The Inheritors. And it's 
it's really sort of like quite industrial um, and it takes some getting used to, but the track Renata, I really love. So yeah, so I, I would say maybe this, yeah. Well, um, I don't know that, what, what label's that on? Uh, Border Community. I think it's the, I think it's uh, his 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 album his label um, or, or his imprint yeah but um, yeah Inheritors is a great album and um, oh, I'm trying to think of others he's got uh, yeah but that one and then he's moved in with he's now doing stuff with a band as well as he oh, I've got a mental blank now what's the recent albums he's had out um, Holden and with Animal, uh, Animal Spirits James yeah Holden, the Animal Spirits Spirit. yeah. oh, yeah, I do I love yeah, I do apologise saying Tony Holden. I know another Tony Holden. I've got them mixed up. James Holden. Sorry, James. Apologies. <laughs> I know. I know a Tony. I know a Tony Holden. That's pathetic. Yeah, I think, and he doesn't make records. Don't we all? <laughs> oh, surrounded by Tony James. Holdens. <laughs> James, I'm sorry. That, that's the title. Of, that's the title of your autobiography, Joe. Surrounded by Tony Holdens. <laughs> Oh, it's going to be a big seller. Cavus, uh, <laughs> hit me with a 10 inch. And uh, do you have any opinions on 10 inch records, either of you in this case? Like, um, just quickly, uh, Steve, do you have an opinion on 10 inch records as a format? Um, I, I, I have no opinion on them. Uh, if, if it's the, it's the, it's what's in the grooves that counts, a well known saying. Um, if it only comes out of that version, I'm, I'm going to be grabbing it. But, um, you know, I, I, in one respect, I, you know, if you've only got a certain amount of music to to offer, then it's the right size format. But um, it, you know, but mo most of the time, I suppose the twelve inch is there for a reason. But I've got no, I've got no opinion on it one way or the other. Um, but I've been a massive seven inch soul collector over years. So the seven inch record, you know, the jukebox seven inch is for me where it was, where it certainly was at soul music because. That was the the history of soul music is the seven inch single, uh, and make made four jukeboxes back in the USA. So with, with that, without the big centers, so records like this, which are oh, oh so <clears throat> one second. So uh, records that a lot of a lot of people in the UK certainly when, they, when I was growing up was, was not were not aware existed were things like this, um, with 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 massive. With massive holes in the middle uh, because they were made specifically for jukeboxes should they become popular. But in the UK, the seven inch single was um, was at a solid center and had to be cut out to put into a jukebox. A stupid arrangement, if you ask me. They may as well have made them with a massive hole in the middle. Yeah, I've got um, I've got like a, a few records of my um, well, of my parents, but also that I just pick up. I got a Thunderclap Newman one. And and um, you can see where you can pop the center out, like it, yeah. it's, it's sort of barely connected. There's like four little dimples oh, that yeah, I could just yeah 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 I've got a few of them yeah yeah but oh, but, you, but in doing that in doing that you destroy the record. It's yeah. no longer mint. Yeah, you know? so you know what, nobody would do that. So to to find some of these early records uh, from from the UK in mint condition gets even harder because of that. Right, yeah, yeah. And do you have a jukebox? No, no, I, I, no. I didn't see the point really. I've got. Uh, I, I prefer to spend the money on albums. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you can just buy a what are they called? Like a little uh, dinker or whatever they're called that you can put in the middle anyway. So they've got a name, yeah, right? Yeah. What, what are they called? Those dinker. Things? I think they're called dinker. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> from, now, from now, they're dinkers. <laughs> That's a nice name. Nice name for Tony them. Dinkers. Tony Dinkers. <laughs> Tony Dinkers, yeah. Cavus, <laughs> uh, hit us with a favourite 10 inch, please. Well, here's the thing. I was watching the um, I was watching your interview with Jimmy Martin this morning while picking the records, and um, when it came to ten inch, I thought, oh, of course, ten inch. So I went to my smallish ten inch pile, and got this out. And as I was getting it out, or Jimmy picked this as well, or take over. So I won't pick that. I got two. I got two. Um, just briefly, one, and it's this a uh, funny German band about whom I know nothing called Jolanda and I saw them supporting Shudder to Think on the Pony Express record tour in um, Dingwalls in London in the early 90s 
And I really, really like the support band, this German band Jolanda, so I bought this and I still listen to it um, every now and then. In fact, Steve, I played this on the radio show when we were in Phoenix FM and you were saying, oh, this is really great. But um, I don't know anything about them other than this one 10 inch, which I really, really like. And then also I thought another lovely one I have, and I just bring this up because I ended up playing with the guy. Do you know Pinback? Rob Crow at all? Yes. It's like uh, that guy Rob Crow, he used to play in Heavy Vegetable and Thingy. And I just picked this one because it's a great, it's a great um, record, but also I ended up playing guitar for Rob Crow about three or four years ago. We really, really wanted him to play in the UK. And so we said, uh, me and my friend Craig from um, North Sea Radio Orchestra sort of had this idea, Rob, why don't you come over to the UK? We'll pay for your flights and it, or, or whatever, do a tour and we'll be your band. And we put together a band to be his band and learn all the stuff. So that was really good fun as well. Ooh, but yeah, this is very nice. Um, uh, that Rob, Rob Crow, a very unsung, yeah, I've got a um, unsung songwriter, I think. Incredible. One of our um, one of our most played records in this house was a record that Elisa, my wife, um, heard on John Peel, and it was Octagonally Yours. Oh man! Oh man! Which one? Uh, it's <laughs> it's like got a. I think it's the first album. Because it's got like a really mental sleeve. I can't remember. It might be self-titled. I can't remember, but it's played all the time. It's just, it's. Uh, there's a song on it called Wilson. It's like Wilson, Mister Wilson. Okay, yeah. That's, it's such a brilliant record, and that's Rob Crow, right? I, I know the one after it better. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's Rob Crow, and uh, P Hicks is the other guy, and they they made them. The reason exclusive. I've got the one afterwards called Exclusively Talent Maker. And it was because it was made exclusively on this funny keyboard, like an early sampling thing called the Talent Maker. <laughs> and uh, yeah, what a, what a beautiful voice he has! Brilliant songwriter, wealth of knowledge about music, extraordinary musician. I mean, he's really, really, you know, I was really on a mission to try and get this guy sort of more well known. Really banging on about him to people because it's it's surprising how how few people know about this. I, I think extraordinary songwriter. Yeah, absolutely. And the octagonal is is an instrument. The octagon. Yeah, the opt yeah, yeah, that's right. The octagon, and so octagonally yours. I think that was the instrument they used on the first record. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, that, which brings me nicely to something I wanted to talk about, and it was to do with the. If if you don't mind, just talking for another minute or two. Sorry, for dragging. I'll, I'll talk for fucking hours. It now, on. But um, it's because so the story is that I, I read a quietest interview with you as a band. Am I correct that the story is, uh, Steve, that you went to watch Sly and the Family Drone play at Cafe Oto and saw M Mike Bourne from Teeth of the Sea fiddling, correct? Yeah. He, he was playing, uh, Herbie, Herbie Kalari were the support band for the evening. And there's another band called Chrononauts were, um, and then Sly and the Family Drone just ripped the place to pieces later on in the evening. And uh, I, you know, I think Matt was in hanging from the rafters, barely naked, and um, as he usually does. Uh, and um, this was the first time I'd, I'd seen a, a modular synthesizer, it, you know, live, and and also a Euro rack one, which is a smaller version than just a big wall like you know Tangerine Dream back in the day. And I, I it was. I, I just was transfixed by the lights and the wires and the fact there was no keyboard. And yeah. I thought, wow, that looks fun. You know, I, I didn't really think any more about it. I thought, oh, well, one of those, you know, yeah. like, that, he looks like he's having fun. So <laughs> I, I, I then eventually sought out, um, uh, you know, I, I, I went up to Mike afterwards and said, well, yeah, what is, what, what's that box? Um, and then the next minute, I, you know, I, I sort of eventually got a Eurorack uh, modular synthesizer and um, started the, the mind-bendingly difficult, especially for me having no real sort of, you know, even synthesizer experience, uh, task of trying to understand what was going on. And somewhere down the line, I got enough of a grip on it that Carver and Mike York said, let's jam. Let's have, a, let's, have a, let's have a day just to hang out and let's try and make some music. And from that original um, mess around, as I, we thought it was a mess around, our first album was made. We, we sat back that night, listened to all of the jams that Mike York had recorded unbeknown to us at the time. And we realized that actually some of this stuff was pretty decent. 
And that was the, the ground, but the basis of the first album. We then worked on certain segments of those improvised tracks. But if I hadn't bumped into uh, Mike York playing in the Polari, it may never have happened. Right, yeah, Mike Bourne, right, yeah, at the uh, Cafe Oto. It's awesome. Oh, Mike Bourne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tony, Tony, Tony Bourne, yeah? Tony Bourne, yeah. Tony York, yeah, Tony York, yeah. <laughs> but just a couple of records I wanted to bring up uh, along that note then, the sort of the influence. This is a this is on the biggest possible scale where someone is influenced by someone making music. Do you, do you know this record here? Yeah. Yeah. I do not, I know of it, but uh, Cecil, um, he's just left us, isn't he? Uh, yeah. Uh, so there they are with their watch them, their massive uh, setup there. Uh, but the influence they had was that Stevie Wonder tucked into it, right? He got massively, wow. in, massively influenced by this album. And then he got these two to produce all of his great records. And I think that's one of the greatest stories. One yeah, of the yeah. Greatest, and, and Steve Hillage. Yeah, it's one of the greatest untold musical stories is the influence of this particular record, which I picked up from Shrewsbury Market because my mum lives there. Um, yeah, so so that's anyway. And, and what does what Tonto stands for? Something fun, doesn't it? It's, I I don't. It might do. The just, Tonto is the instrument, isn't it? It stands for something like timbrel orchestra or something. The T O of Tonto is timbrel orchestra, I think. But right, right. It's it's very it's, possible. I can't but, Radical Mark, Mark like Cecil, being... sorry, the guy's Malcolm. He just died like last week, didn't he? Oh fuck! <laughs> yeah. Is it like the is it like the instrument in Barbarella? <laughs> it's I, well, it's this here. Look at them. It's whatever that is. But anyhow, <laughs> I, I I just like the fact that when you you know you can be so heavily influenced by someone that you can do this. And in the same way, you could go and watch Sly and the Family Drone and Mike Bourne do his thing at Cafe Oto. And, and you can end up like basically starting a band and releasing records. It's just picking up <laughs> things and being influenced. It's, you know, it's similar though to me. It's just, why not? Why can't that be the same thing? I think it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you have any more records you want to show? Uh, sorry, I, I don't know if I... I... I don't know if I was glitching out, but yeah, Malcolm Cecil from Tonto, he, he passed away just a couple of weeks ago, didn't he? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know. But, um, so um, that's, yeah, that bad. Of course, I don't know. Should know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, do you have any more records you want to show? Or Death is real. Mm. I've, got, I've got one I thought... Show a few more. I've got one I thought was quite relevant in as much as it has a... It's the connection with Mike Ball a bit. Um, so... Fast forward to after after um, our first album that you just held up was out. We we started doing some gigs uh, on the and that was the idea that Rocket Recordings wanted us to do some gigs, which was which was mind blowing for me. It really sort of like I, God knows why I said yes, but it's been an absolute experience. So we did a few gigs and we they were okay. We we we, we sort of we we got away with it effectively. We were learning our sort of trade to some degree. Uh, nothing terrible happened, but maybe no, no magic happened. And then the first time we played in London on a gig, we were supporting Teeth of the Sea um, at Oslo in um, Hackney. And on that evening, things went really well for us. And we recorded a piece of music, the whole one piece of music. Um, and it was it was our most, it was up to date, that, that was our best ever gig. And in the process of lockdown happening, we then put out a few other albums. So we've had three more albums, which have been limited edition pressings on vinyl that have been more long form pieces. And one of these pieces was called Dream Sweeper. So this is the album, Dream Sweeper. That's Carvis's, that's Carvis's handiwork, Lino Cut. Uh, I stand in the middle and um, the album is called, and the see at the top there, it's got the Utopia Strong. So. We pressed up 250 of these and, and let them dry in my snoop room at the time. Laborious, you can't believe it, but it was a great fun. And, and they, they were amazingly snapped up very quickly. But along the way of pressing these albums up and printing them, uh, we were having a few beers. And Mike York, who was in charge of 
of actually pressing the covers onto the lino cut, Carver's was actually putting the ink on, and then Mike York's responsibility was to put the lino uh, cut the covers on. At a bit of a magical moment where he actually put the ink side on the same side as the track listing, which should have been on the back. So this is a one-off. It's, it's one of its kind. So it actually, this white area is a label that's been printed on top of. So this is the infamous Dream Sweeper, one of a kind. So there are 250 in existence. And this one album is, uh, is one of those numbers. We, I don't think we even know which one it is. And we've still got it and we don't know what to do with it. So at some stage we might auction it off for charity or something. I don't know. So that, yeah, that, that's Dream Sweeper. We're really proud of Dream Sweeper. And, and then Teeth of the Sea went on. We had such a great night. Did, did you play um did, and do you played with them during the lockdown time as well didn't you was that like half a year ago or so that, yeah december the 8th that was december yeah yeah at, yeah, at clapham grand which was yeah. brilliant yeah great fun and lo i just love it you know love to do a gig again in that brief window you know but yeah that's the sort of that's the sort of venue that um I, certainly I could only have a dream of playing and I can imagine during lockdown maybe they only let in like one or two hundred people so it kind of becomes exactly within reach Carvis, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you got any yeah. records there um, to hold up? I've got a couple to hold up actually one because I can't remember if one of the things was the most expensive record but i thought I, I, because i'm a little bit annoyed about this um and this was certainly the most expensive record when i bought it at the time i just moved up to london um and from notting hill record and tape exchange i bought and i've been after this for a while i bought uh mother's invention, mother's invention weasels rip my flesh i paid 14 quid for this i know that because i keep all the receipts i used to post the receipts in and also there's the there's the thing however not only is this my favorite or oh, one of my favorite LP covers. It's a great album as well. But what made me so cross and still to this day makes me cross is they put the fucking 14 quid, which on the doll was a lot of money. They put the label there and I couldn't take the label off without leaving this bloody white, you know, it's, it's, it's ruined the cover. And it makes me so cross that they used to do that. So um, screw you, Notting Hill Record and Tape Exchange. Lighter fluid. And then there was another one. I can't Lighter remember why. Fluid. I, well, I tried. I tried light of fluid. I don't think it worked. Maybe I didn't. I don't know. Is that the secret? Two lots. Two lots of light of fluid. And I can't remember what the reason for bringing this was, other, other than, other than, I think, uh, other than when we were talking about sort of 1989 and favourite record shops. The other key up record for me of 1989 was uh, Voivod Nothing Face, and for me, this and On Land. Where is it? This just rewired my DNA. These two albums, and. Gun to my head, they're probably, I don't know if that's my, my favourite, um, the albums have had the most impact on me. Um, and, and I t just to have been alive at a time where both these bands were, I think, at their creative peak, to make these, to, it's so exciting to, to have, to be 17 years old I was in 1989 and to hear, to have these two absolute, you know, life-changing albums. And, and the funny thing was, all you would see in the, in the music press was that in 1989, was the, about the Stone Roses. Now, I quite like that first Stone Roses album. You know, it's all right. It, it's like a good, it's like the best of the monkeys or something. It's got a monkey's vibe. But the very idea that the music press was creaming itself over an album that's already sounded 20 years old in 1989, you know, there was no new ground being covered. In the same year, we were getting like Godflesh, Street Cleaner, and these two fuckers. And it's like, these, these sound like nothing <laughs> else that had ever come before them. Even by the band themselves and they were going on about this bloody like stone roses album it's like really really that's what that's where we are now and that's that was where my um that, that's <laughs> that's where me and the mainstream music press sort of <laughs> parted ways the um cardiac car, cardiacs to me to my memory never got much love from the music press correct like he's frozen he's frozen again it's clapham it's Clapham, East London. What's happened? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Is he back? He's back. back. I glitched. Sorry. All I heard was all I heard, Joe, is you said cardiac, and then it, there was yeah. a glitch out. So what, what, what I wanted to say was that cardiacs never got, to my memory, never got a great deal of love in the music press. 
<laughs> no, they, they got a great deal of hate, though. It wasn't like they were ignored. They were just hated, but, you know. Yeah. Why? Uh, I don't know. Because, uh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I, 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 I thought, honestly, when A Little Man in a House came out, I thought it's only a matter of time before everybody realises this is the, the, you know, the, this is the greatest, but clearly um, that that time didn't <laughs> that time didn't come. Although it's ironically now, you know, years and years later, it's starting slowly, slowly starting to happen. Maybe our book might push it one stage forward. I don't know, but um, yeah, <laughs> what what a, what an honour and uh, what a, a joy to have been part of that whole insane, insanely beautiful carnival that was Cardiacs. Yeah, yeah, marvelous band. Um, so I think we should call it a um, afternoon, um, but uh, hold your book up again. Let's do like what they would on telly. Yeah, yes. Uh, in all good, um, in all good High Street, W. H. Smiths. I know whatever. I don't know. I don't know. If it is is it out? Yeah, I suppose it would be in the shop now. Yeah, but yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Oh, you get it rough trade as well. But I mean, regardless of whether it sells or not, it's been great fun writing it because because it's. Um, it's nice to write about a your hobby, but and, and I know for for Carvis it's a profession, but also I know full well as you can hear from talking to it. it yeah, when, if you're a fan of, of the music, you, you you can't help but talk about it. I mean that's the reason why the three of us are sitting here uh, glitching for the last hour and a half. <laughs> yeah, we really have been. Joe, glitching. we're we're sick. This is the worst glitching I've had glitching on, on this thing. Really weird, <laughs> but anyhow. It's been oh, really sorry. good talking. I, I said such interesting stuff. <laughs> Joe, we're in we're in Glastonbury a lot. So what? Hey, let's let's meet up for a drink when we're next there. You're just down the road, right? I'm all in. Yeah, email me or however you want to do it. Be great to meet up in real real yeah, life. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot for joining in. Anyway, um, so I, I hope people made it to the end because there was too many glitches. It was carnage. But hey, thanks for joining in. Okay. We're going to so wave. Much. We're going to wave and I'm going to press stop like they do on Bullseye. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>